will get us going. And uh, I'm going to call our meeting to order a roll call, please, Todd. Do you want to do that? Yes, I will. Uh, David Kennedy. Here. Chris Elner. Here. Jeff Tuz. Here. Kristen Runge. Here. Al Dassau. Here. And absent is Ann Lewandowski and Jeff Smith. Okay, thanks, Todd. Um, next, we have our minutes. Look for a motion on our minutes. Uh, before we get the motion, there is one correction. Okay, go ahead. And it is under number one, uh, the second paragraph. Our first word says board that the plan commission be directed. B as in the letter B as opposed to BE. Don't okay. you know that? Don't we're using texting <laughs> systems here? You're lucky. You're lucky. We spelled out neighborhoods. You know, I'm always under the theory that you always make one mistake, one simple mistake, and that's caught, and the major mistakes aren't even looked at. I, I, All right. So I think Al was a CP I, at one point in his life. Um, <laughs> 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 that sure sounded like it. So thank you, Al. Um, we'll have that correction. Okay. Anything else? Otherwise, I'd look for a motion. Al, do you want to make a motion then? I'll make a motion. Okay. That's corrected. We have a motion by Al and then a second by Kristen. Uh, roll call, Ted. Uh, Chris Elner. Yes. Al Dassau. Yes. Jeff Tews. Yes. Kristen Rungi. Yes. And David Kennedy. Yeah. All right. Passes 5 0. Thank you. And then uh, we have uh, our public comment section for anything that anybody would like to address us with. I don't see anybody in the crowd. Is that fair, Todd? Or correct. Fair? I don't see. Correct. I don't see any attendees. I am recording the presentation, and I will. We will put it up on the Village's YouTube channel. Perfect. Okay. Sounds good. Then next item under new business: discuss and consider all recommendations to be made to the Village Board on Housing Task Force recommendations. Four: work with developers and lenders to pursue funding assistance. Seven: small smaller development projects. Eight: small scale real estate ownership projects. And nine: range of affordability and housing types within developments. I'd also point out. Kristen, I'm glad uh, you're here tonight, and I hope you're feeling better. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to let Nicole take it away. I'm going to um, pull up the memo that was in your packet, and then she can uh, direct me how to scroll through that as we go along. Great. Thank you, Todd. All right, so um, what was in your packet is just copied from what I had sent to Todd. So after our last, you know, several meetings going through those recommendations and having great discussion about, you know, steps um, that the village could take to encourage different types of uh, housing options and levels of affordability. Um, these are kind of the recommendations that um, I pulled out of those discussions and have uh, reviewed with Todd and Jason as well. Um, so I also have this up on, on my computer, you know, in the Word document. So if there are tweaks or adjustments that we want to discuss and make as we go along, I, I can capture those in real time. So the, the first, um, I'd say the first seven are tied to the, the first meetings that we had regarding um, funding sources and, and levels of affordability. So these are really tied to, um, you know, we talked about outside financing sources and then sources that the village can employ directly. Um, so in terms of outside financing sources, kind of capturing the different um, sources that are available for affordable housing and how the village can uh, encourage developers to utilize those and also um, help make projects more competitive or more likely to get those funds. Do folks, did they? Did you take a look at this, or should we just go go through one by one? Does that make? Hey Nicole, I just got a general question before we get into some of the details. In that above, we articulate what the task force recommendations are, but we don't delineate down below which is responsive to each recommendation. And I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just that there's we're not identifying task force recommendation number four is the following number. Number five is the following per se, and, mm -hmm. and that's okay. I just uh, it, it loses the identity towards to the task force. That's my comment, and I, if that's the intent that's fine. I think Al, in the in what we put together, that's going to go to the board. I think we'll we'll have a better job of laying this out a little bit more, more um, I guess extensively, completely. Yeah, no, that's that's a good comment. Thank you, Al. Sometimes you get so 
you know, the, those are so ingrained in my brain, it's good to step back and, and tie those directly to, to the recommendations. Is it fair to say that all of these correspond uh, reasonably well to a recommendation in that report, but that we omitted some of the recommendations? Do you think, is there anything that's new here that wasn't in those recommendations? No, no, they all tie to those. That, that was my, that was what I thought. Mm -hmm. hey, do you guys want to go through them one, one at a time or just have a over, general overview? Anybody have any specific, any feelings one way or the other? I mean, the general I overview is yeah. fine, but I don't know yeah. if that's just me. Other people might I was, I was there too, Kristen. So if people are okay with that, I'm good with it. So can I have a thumbs up from everybody for general overview? Chris, what does that mean? You were there too. You were aware. You mean, you mean as far as what, at the task force? Yes. Oh, at the task force. Okay. No, I, Chris, you mean... You also are fine with the general overview because oh, you've yeah. read I'm, 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 Can you see me? I, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm good with a general overview. Okay. So um, the first um, three are talking about basically working with and encouraging developers to pursue um, the WIDA tax credits, which we, we talked about in detail, particularly in areas where they are high, high scoring applications and have a greater likelihood of being funded. Um, and then also um, working to secure funds through Dane County and the different housing programs that we discussed, as well as the, the Federal Home Loan Bank and also um, the Workforce Housing Fund that the MDC, Madison Development Corp, uh, has newly started administering. The fourth one is um, uh, a little- Nicole, yes. on, on number three, um, just a question. Mm -hmm. Has does this, I know the answer to this question, I'm trying to think of the right way to say it, so I'm just gonna say it. And uh, as, an, as I'm a, uh, a, a, a borrowing possibility or a loan program, would the village ever consider the CDA issuing bonds to support a housing project? Um, I think that was something that we had a discussion about in terms of the CDA using its um, ability to finance projects as well as self-develop. And the, the impression that I got was that, yes, maybe in the future, but right now let's get our feet wet with some of these other sources. And if we have the capacity, because that's something also from a you know a capacity and staffing standpoint that the village would have to use. That's, that's what I recalled from our uh, CDA meeting when we went over that item. Okay. Al, did that answer your question? I want to make sure your question's answered. Yeah, it, and, and it gets to a bigger issue. And I don't know, I understand these are recommendations to the village board. If they're short-term in duration, that's fine. But if they're long-term in duration, I'd like to open it up to not just our short-term thinking, and that is the long-term thinking. Should we be thinking about CDA uh, lending or borrowing to fund a project? And that's why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. might be something like explore the future capability of the CDA to issue bonds for developments as well as self-develop properties. Yes, exactly. David, go ahead. Well, it seemed like we're a long ways away from that, um, you know, when the plan commission and the village board really don't do anything with anything that we've sent them so far. Uh, I can't imagine them even stepping up and uh, wanting to give us any kind of authority to do uh, bonding. Is that fair, Chris? I think it's a, an appropriate thing, David, for Al's suggestion to put it in there now to start to press that issue about what is going to be our boundaries. So. As oh, far as what we're, using, we're not doing at the board, David, with implementing, um, I think we've done so far with what we've had brought to us with regards to our TIF that we talked about for ex uh, extending a TIF, our decisions that we made here, we have implemented that already and done that with the board voting to approve the TIF uh, extension. 
um, what we're going to be talking about in that next agenda item is how we should be spending those funds. Um, you know, what, what is the appropriate way to do that? Um, so we'll get to that at that point. As far as your question about how much power, how much authority is the CDA going to be given? I think that we created the CDA to implement these programs and out of the CDA, we can make recommendations to the village board to see if they're going to, if I don't know how they would vote on it, um, how many powers they'll grant to the CDA. That really is what we're going to be saying. Here's the why we want to grant the powers to the CDA to do this. I think that's something that we would have to do as a committee um, to the board before the board is going to consider, you know, saying, yeah, you guys have authority to do this. That, that, that's my take on where the board read is. Where I would be on supporting that, I don't know yet. I mean, I'm, I'm going to wait to see what, what we're all stating in here um, and, and listen to what you're stating. And my only point is just giving the option to the board uh, to utilize a, CP, a CDA in that capacity. That's it. Okay. And I, I, I would add that I think that would be like, it, I think that'd be a project specific uh, issue. Like it, it, you, I don't see the need for the CDA to be, you know, just granted a carte blanche. Okay, you can do this. Good luck to you. It's probably going to be something uh, sort of delivered to the CDA in concert with a project in which that sort of mechanism will make a whole lot of sense. So I think it's, it's going to, I would see that maybe happening as a, kind of a, a, a package of sorts with the project. And I, I would also defer, Kristen, do you have any opinion on that? Is that how you kind of would read the board too? Yeah, I would, I would just from a safe, like a safety standpoint, um, always want the decision whether or not to issue a bond to rest with the actual elected body. Um, so should something go wrong, that they're the ones held responsible and not the appointed committee members um, there, you know, there, there is, you know, bonds in a well-run organization like ours would probably be fine, but I would rather that the CDA recommend a bond be issued than have the authority on its own to issue the bond. Um, and, and that way the legal responsibility for what does and doesn't happen. And if any action would result negatively from that, that it's the elected officials who are, are held responsible for it. And I'm okay with that. Uh, Todd, do you recall, I, I seem to have some memory with that about 10, 15 years ago, the, uh, the CDA under the uh, recommendation to the board did, did uh, approve or uh, come up with some CDA bonds or something. We've gone through this process once before, I think, many, 10, 15 years ago. We did that for the ice rink, if you recall. There, they, they wanted a reef, there was a position to refi and we used CDA conduit financing to uh, support that refi. So there is some precedence. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. I, yep. In fact, that's why we actually created a CDA for that purpose back, back, yeah, 10 years ago. Okay. Okay, move on, Nicole, go ahead. All right, so um, the fourth item is, is similar in terms of, uh, again, another outside funding source, but this would be a potential partnership between the village and a developer um, for WEDC funding for a specific uh, site, likely a downtown, a downtown site um, for redevelopment. They have funding sources specific to that. Um, and then the fifth is- Can you know, we stop on the fourth? Hold on, Nicole, go ahead, Al. <laughs> yeah. I hate to be nitpicky, but no, I am. This, this is good. Um, the word partner is what is bothersome to me. And mm -hmm. partner means uh, perhaps financial involvement, financial connection, uh, and also some um, responsibility uh, to the developer. I just don't like the word partner unless we're willing to financially commit to a project. So, yeah, the, the reason that's phrased a little differently is um, these specific funding sources through WEDC generally require the applicant to be the municipality, and then the municipality right. feeds those funds into the project. So they, you know, the municipality, the village in this case gets a grant, and then the grant is transferred to the project entity. Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. All right, um, and then we get into uh, TIF. 
So uh, I, I expect some discussion here. Um, I, I broke this out into a few, a few different types or scenarios. Um, so first is pursuing the one year TID extension as allowed per state statute for village TIDs, particularly those that are closing early. Each extension will still require village board review and a resolution. So this is like the extension that was just um, approved. Um, again, I think in our discussions, it was clear that due to you know, the relationship with the school district and other entities that rely on taxes, um, that we would want to pursue that uh, for the, the TIDs that are closing early. So it's not like you know, you're know you taking away funds that the school district is counting on, for example. Um, this is still something that would have to be approved again on a case by case basis. Um, but the idea of this recommendation is to ensure that it's something being considered seriously considered um, each time the opportunity arises because it is the main you know, viable source for affordable housing program funds. And tied to that is, is the second one is to utilize funds from those extensions to support future housing projects and programs, develop a flexible policy for use of those funds. And that of course ties into what is next on the agenda and uh, the, the draft policy um, for the program that Todd has sent out. Okay, any comments or questions, raise your hand. El, you're, you're, I can tell you're ready to go again. I, I could just see it, go ahead. What else do retired guys do? <laughs> <laughs> so um, under B, and A is fine. Uh, under B, utilize funds from the extension to support future affordable housing projects. You simply have a, a housing projects. And affordable may, be, may have been left out for a reason. Um, I think, then, you know, another, another word to use there might be qualified. Um, and I, you know, qualified under our, our policies, policies and policies and programs that we create. Yeah, so there is, um, you know, under the state statute, the funds from the extension, 75% of that has to be utilized for affordable housing. So technically you have some wiggle room where it could be used for, you know, something else. Um, so kept that a little general, knowing that the majority, if not all of it, would be for affordable housing and how the village would more specifically define that um, would be part of that. Okay. Then the last sentence, develop a flexible policy for use of the funds. I still have troubles with maybe trouble is the wrong word. I don't know necessarily what the money is going to be used for in general. And then the policies are what supports the, uh, the use of the money, of course, or how to implement the use of the money. So I, this is in my terms, develop a business plan for, for, program, uh, for program development and a flexible policy for use of the funds. I still have troubles with, okay, so we're gonna get $440,000 that's gonna go into a pot, what's the use? And who's gonna decide whether we're gonna have a loan program, whether we're gonna have a down payment pro program, whether we're gonna have, um, create a, a land trust. And, and that's where, I don't know yet what, the, what we're buying into. What is the program we're buying into with this $440,000? So, go ahead, Jason. Okay. No, I was still speaking. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. As, as opposed to being given 440 and then saying, well, we have a policy and we're going to use it for something, whatever that something is. So I'm just trying to get a macro vision within a, some type of overall plan. And then within that vision, come up with the uh, policies that support the different ideas within the plan. Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> Looking at this again, and I, I did review this once before it, it came to you guys, but um, <clears throat> I'm wondering, and this kind of maybe helps to respond to Al's question here, uh, whether there should be a standalone item that is establishing in a, a Village of Wanakee affordable housing fund with corresponding uh, rules and, and uh, programs for the use of those funds. 
um, which, which is getting to the very thing that we're going to be doing next on the agenda tonight and kind of pulling that out. It's kind of buried in five right now. I mean, the last question is, well, wh what are we doing with that money? And I'm suggesting maybe that's a standalone item. Let's create a fund and we can just come up with some wording to describe you know, how we're coming up with the rules and who decides on the use of those funds. And then in this one about TIF, we say use TIF extensions to capitalize that fund. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for 5B, we, we would say utilize the TIF extension funds to capitalize the village of Wanakee affordable housing fund, whatever you may call it, with a separate recommendation either before this, after it, which is create village of Wanakee affordable housing fund. Yeah, and, and maybe a, maybe that gets bundled into A, it's just mm -hmm. pursue extensions that feed into the affordable housing fund. So yeah, whether it's a, a, a grant program to a loan program, I think that's what we're going to discuss next, Dale, and how yes. we can how we can disperse those funds, um, and and almost like a, a our community foundation, our grants that come through those where people apply for those with specific specific things, where we would then be able to decide, yeah, we can we'll fund this or we won't fund this, but it's specific to guide. We have guidelines in there that kind of let us know which way we're going to go with that before we even hear about it. Um, so it's not my opinion or your opinion on it. It's more, here's what, this, what the guidelines are for what we should be giving out for. And then what's the, the amounts we should be giving. And we'll discuss that in the next thing, but that, that's, that is our goal with the program, in, in my opinion. Todd, am I saying that right? The main thing is if Nicole can interpret that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so one of the things that came, I mean, the reason we're discussing this particular topic is Cohen Esri, um, we have this pot of money now that's going to be there. Should we be giving it all to them? Or should we be keeping it? Or, or should they be getting a maximum amount that maybe we want to use some money for? Maybe we have some seniors that are in fixed incomes that can't fix up their windows. You know, maybe we have a, a monies available for that, um, that type of program. That's what we really need to figure out with how we're gonna handle the program. Nicole, does that make sense? Yes, okay. yes it does. I just wanna clarify, going back to what Jason said, um, do we want the, you know, the creation of the Village of Wanakee Affordable Housing Fund to be a standalone recommendation so it stands out a bit or, or keep it within the, this TIF recommendation? Can it be in both spots? Could we have it in both areas or would that be confusing? Um, I mean, I, I would I would have it as a standalone and then and then reference it in, in the TIF recommendation that way. And I would agree either, either way, it's mm -hmm. it is being funded by the extension of the TIF. Mm -hmm. So that's the cross reference. And likewise, just as a precursor to free, uh, Number 11 and number 12, I believe, are also part of this as well. Mm -hmm. My only um, question is if, you know, if it's a standalone recommendation, if that raises questions of creative fund, like where is that money coming from? If it's within the, the TIF extension recommendation, you, you know, you can sort of tie to how it's supported and funded. It's not coming from other other dollars in, in the village's budget. But on the other hand, if it's a standalone item, uh, it is more more clear that this isn't necessarily the only source of funding. So say, for example, uh, there was a uh, corporation that was willing to support affordable housing, but wanted to do it, was maybe mm -hmm. interested in doing it through the village, or there was, you know, someone wanted to, uh, in their in their will or something, uh, donate some money, that, that a standalone fund could be the uh, vehicle for other sources to utilize. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I'll, I'll mark it up as um, it'll be recommendation five ahead of the TIF recommendation. I would say something like create the village of 
Wanaki Affordable Housing Fund um, to be funded with TIF extension dollars as noted below and any other available financing sources, something to that vein. Okay. I would let the CDA know that I'm um, carefully watching and participating in several seminars now about the, the recent Recovery Act um, that is supplying communities with funds. Um, and uh, the definitions of the potential use are coming into clear focus almost as we speak. We had a couple meetings this week to learn more about it. Um, the the 1.38 million that Wanaki is to receive um, is a big number, um, and you know one one thing going through my head is whether whether that can supply seed money for programs that might be important to the village. This perhaps being one of them. So I just want to let you know that I've got an eye on that. Um, more info to come. We shall see. Um, there are some parameters that are going to have to keep us that we're going to have to stay within bounds on, but um, this this may be the type of thing that could relate to its purpose. Okay, thanks, Ted. Okay, Nicole, you can continue on. I... All right, um, and then the the last sub C under this TIF uh, recommendation is related to project specific. TIF application. So not necessarily projects being funded by the extension funds, but rather your more traditional, you know, project specific TIF application um, for, for sites that are within a TID. Of course, they would have to go through the normal village review process and be able to support um, their request via the, in the increment that they would be generating. Um, but for you know, projects that are mixed income that might be hitting the, the 80 to 120% AMI, you know, range, those will still, you know, generate a significant amount of increment. So it might be a good fit for, for project specific uh, TIP applications. Okay, everybody good with that? I have a comment on that. Okay. Uh, um only because it's under the uh, number five. And I, the way I was reading number five initially is it dealt with the extension. Mm -hmm. And this can go both ways. It can, it can be part of the extension proceeds or it can be part of a separate standalone TID request of which as you heard pre previously, I'm generally not in favor of doing a TID just for a multifamily. Mm -hmm. However, um, if, if it is part of a bigger TID district, then I'm okay with it. But this can go both ways. And, uh, and again, I'm not certain when I utilize tax increment financing to support affordable housing development, if this gets convoluted in that it's the intent is it's not just the one year extension we're talking about, but it's also the fact that we're perhaps including TID requests or uh, TIF requests within a larger TID, irregardless of, of the, uh, of the uh, extension requirement. Jason, go ahead. I, I would, based on the discussion I've heard with respect, you know, at the village board with respect to um, how people would prefer uh, the, these things to go, you know, with the Cohen Esri project and the use of the extension funds. Um, I, I, my sense is that the preference is to have extension funds go into an affordable housing program with established rules, as opposed to it being a uh, request specific uh, grant where, uh, you know, the extension is being made because of the request. And so if, if that's the case, um, I would characterize the TID extension as is, is about supporting the affordable housing fund. There's a step in the middle there. And then projects can apply to that fund. Uh, and then, and maybe this is just two items under here, A and B, not A, B, C. And then the second one here is about uh, being supported directly by an active TID. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a major distinction, but. Yeah, no, uh, I, I think, 
I think A and B could be combined and we could, like you said, um, utilize funds from the extension to capitalize the affordable housing fund, maybe whereby projects can uh, apply to that fund, um, you know, at the, based on the program rules or something like that. And then separately, the project specific TIF applications. Mel, does that distinction help you yes, or make does. sense to you? Yes, it does. Yep, that's fine. <clears throat> You're muted, Chris. Jeff, did you have something you wanted to say? Or are you? Well, I just was wondering whether there's um, uh, sequencing of any of this that's that's important to us or that we mentioned. I know we talked about it on the project on uh, the Cohen project, but um, is there WIDA uh, approval first? Does do they need you know what what are the, I know again the discussion took place and being new to this it's a little hard for me to understand but do we need to clarify any of those um, that sequencing of events that lead to a fund or is that um, uh, we'll, we'll just take it however we can get it in terms of how the projects um the timeline of these funding sources, you can see it both ways. So some projects will want to get all of these gap financing sources before they apply to a weed, to WIDA. Um, it can help your competitiveness. Um, but then, you know, depending on how the timing works and when they get site control and when they get things pulled together for that WIDA application, these other sources may, may fall after that. Um, so I don't think you have to you know, specify for the developer when when they should or can apply. Does that get to your question? Yeah, I think it, uh, yeah. And, and then I guess the second part of the question is, would we require um, any of those other steps to take place before we would create a TID or before we would um, do, do any action? Or is there gonna be any sequencing or requirements that we're gonna, we're gonna wanna place on this? And maybe that comes later. Yeah, so, so say um, someone came in and they, they applied for the affordable housing fund um, before, before the WIDA application. If the village wrote you know, an award letter or something they could include in their application, that would absolutely be contingent on, their, on them securing tax credits and all of the other sources, you know, demonstrating financial feasibility. That's detail that's needed, but not something we create at this point. Yes, I would agree. Okay. David or Kristen, any comments there? No, I'm good. No, no. Okay. Okay. I think we've okay. got it. All right, go ahead, Nicole. Um, the next two are really about more outreach. Um, so this is something that, you know, Todd already uh, does a great job with in terms of engaging with WIDA, Dane County Housing, um, you know, just really having the village out there and sending the message that you are open to um, housing developments and looking for partners. And then the second is just providing that support, that kind of community support and, um, you know, anything from preliminary discussions about you know, available properties and zoning and what, what would be a good fit to likely some referrals to some of these financing sources we've talked about, support letters for applications to make them more competitive, that sort of thing. I'd, I'd um, offer that I think the village board took action last night that is really going to be a shot in the arm for our efforts here. They, the board created the position of community development director within the village organization. Um, there are some other elements to the organization that that's being tweaked, but the, uh, the economic development duties, uh, largely the kind of the, both some of the day-to-day -day as well as some uh, kind of the foot on the gas pedal on our economic initiatives is going to fall upon the community development director along with fostering of all of our other work through the plan commission. And in fact, that position will um, become the lead staff to the CDA. Um, so what I'm excited about is somebody who will have 
a, a new, fresh, and probably level of expertise in this that that no staff currently have here, including myself, um, and that can give more time and attention to it on behalf of the board and the CDA. So I think that's going to go a long way to help on these two items. Okay. Okay, Nicole. Okay. Um, and then the this last several recommendations are from our more recent discussion. Hey, um, Nicole. Yep. Can we just go back to number seven? And, and I sure. appreciate, Todd, your input because that was one of my recommendations is we need to get some perhaps someone involved with a direct connection for our, our group and, and promotion of affordable housing and accountability to this group. That, I think that's a great move is to get someone on board to do that as well as the economic development component of it. But number seven, sticking by its, is this just general? I'm not quite understanding in the context of affordable housing because it's really simply to me saying in regards to general housing developments and land developers that Todd or whomever is going to do their uh, networking and, and, and doesn't really identify any particular housing. Is, is it just a general comment that we're getting at or is it something particular to affordable housing? I mean, I, I think it's more general because these initial discussions are often very general themselves, right? Like what is the type of, they may, may not have specifics on who exactly are we serving? What types of uh, affordability levels? They, a developer might come with an idea and say, we want to do all high end market rate. And after discussing, they might say, okay, it's clear to me that you have a need for more of a mix. Um, I also think that you know the task force report talked about a variety of housing types as well and not just purely affordable. So, so it's important to encourage that as well. Okay, Al, is that good? I think it's yeah, general. Well, I think it was general too. That's the way I would have taken that one. Yeah, and it, 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 I mean, in the context of what I thought was more affordable housing, you're stepping back a little bit, which is fine if that's the intent. Okay. Um, the next one is from our, our discussion. Um, I had initially talked about one of the zoning districts, uh, you know, the different types of zoning districts that allow for more than a, a single family home. Um, so what we uh, ended up with after a discussion of that at our last meeting was the idea of expanding the use of zoning and districts that allow for uh, what we said is two to eight attached units. So uh, a, smaller, a smaller development um, where you know, those types of projects would be allowed maybe by right, maybe with a conditional use, but having more of a variety of of zoning districts in play rather than you know just the, the PUDs and, and single family districts. The only comment I would have on that is, uh, and only because it's consistent through the rest of the document, ex uh, expand use of zoning districts that allow for two to eight attached units, which I agree with, and encourage housing developers to build them, right? whatever the appropriate lingo is to be more proactive in getting the village to do something, not just create, but also whatever, advertise, promote, help encourage uh, that type of development. I'd agree with that. Anybody who disagrees with that, if you do, raise your hand and state why. All right, seeing none. Okay. Great. I've got that and think so. All right, um, and this next one was uh, our discussion about accessory dwelling units or ADUs. Um, so thank you to Jason for helping me clean up this language a bit. Um, the idea here being that ADUs could be allowed with a conditional use permit um, on properties um, that already allow two units or more. So it wouldn't be a, a surprise where you bought a house in a, in a single family zoned uh, area and some suddenly your neighbor was building an extra unit. So it would be in areas where, that already allow two units or more with an owner occupied you know, single family home. It would be allowed with a conditional use permit to, um, to build an, an accessory dwelling unit. And this again, would be something that um, would then be directed to the, the plan commission to further uh, review those standards.
Okay, any other comments with regards to this one? Or is everybody good with this one? Read a thumbs, thumbs up if you're good. Great, thanks everyone. Okay, um, moving on, uh, then we have encouraged developers to include areas designated for small and medium density projects within PUD zoning for subdivisions to create a complete neighborhood. And um, honestly, you know, in, in talking with Jason, I think this is something that the village um, already does and when, when looking at, at subdivisions, um, but just kind of reinforcing that to um, work with developers to ensure that there's a variety of housing types planned for within those large subdivisions and not just purely single family uh, traditional homes. All right, um, and then we're moving on to um, consider developing a, re a rehab loan program for older housing stock. This would include owner occupied and rental properties. Um, I'll just jump in quick and add that in the research that I did for our next agenda item, um, I did find that these affordable housing uh, funds that have been created a program like this is probably the most typical that I've seen in other communities. Um, there was some language I included in that board memo. Hopefully you had a chance to peek at it, but you did see that a lot of communities make use of that, that, that fund to design programs like this. They're, they seem to be rather, um, uh, what's the word, uh, rigorous? There's some rigor involved in application and management. Um, but the supply, the sort of the funding supply source uh, has come from that affordable fund. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one of the reasons it's so popular is, you know, it's kind of, um, it's kind of a twofer in terms of, you know, the, the homeowners or the property owner is getting a more affordable way to rehab their, their property, but it's also kind of helping to revitalize what may be an area with older housing stock that could use use a refresh, so. And the only thing I would add about, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I was just wondering, it, it, uh, I, is the wording in this one needed to comment to Al and Kristen's point before that right now we're not going to be the, the, the place that would hold that fund that this would be recommending that the board consider a developing rehabilitation loan pro program? Uh, this is worded, uh, it, it's not clear whether that means we're going to do that or whether we're recommending that the village board do that. You know, I actually think, Jeff, that our next discussion item, that this may be an element that get kind of get, gets lumped in to one of the earlier items as, as, as one of several programs within our overall, you know, offer, list of offerings. The other thing I was going to add, and I don't, I don't know if it's important language here, Nicole, or not, but if it's the affordable housing fund from TIF extension that's used, these rehab loans would also have to f meet the, um, the income, you know, the affordable qualification. Correct. So I don't know if that, if that needs to be identified. Maybe it's not necessary for this, but that will come into play if that's the funding source. Yeah, yeah. One of the things you'll see on like the application materials for, for communities that have, have adopted a program utilizing TIF extension is there is a requirement in there that your housing costs be 30% or less of your income to ensure it's affordable. Well, we'll probably get to this, but Todd, I think your, your point is that we need to take all of these funding and programs and put them into one uh, one spot to summarize those rather than having them spotted throughout this, uh, these recommendations. Yeah, I mean, in the least, in the least, I'd say that it's possible that that's how it may evolve in as we work to create it. I, you know, that might make the, the best sense to everybody involved. Yeah. One of my questions on this, on that is, uh, and this is maybe something for Brian Kleinmeier to chew on, but uh, I think the language in the statutes about what qualifies as affordable housing uh, is is a, a, a little bit uh, vague. By that I mean, uh, if you if 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 it's used to support rehab of a home that is 
uh, affordable at 80% of the of the county median income, um, does the occupant have to be have income that is 80% of the county median income? Uh, I would suggest that it's loose enough that you wouldn't have to regulate an income qualification on some of this, that, that kind of program. I, I think that's a, from my knowledge, that's a gray area. Mm -hmm. And maybe that addresses my question on number 11. And I simply put in uh, consider developing a rehab loan program for older affordable housing. Just because the house is old doesn't mean it's not a half million bucks or a million dollar home and we're gonna to lend to it. Mm -hmm. So it's gotta have some criteria wrapped around it. And my earlier comment that both number 11 and number 12 are really subsections, I believe, to the TIF extension. And perhaps should be repositioned uh, under the TIF extension paragraph because that's what's gonna fund it. I don't know what else would fund it. It's not the intent for the village board to fund a rehab loan program. And it's not the intent, I don't believe it's the intent for the village board to fund a community land trust. That money would be funded by the TIF extension is what I believe would happen. It could also um, be funded through Dane County funds as well. So if the village or a developer working with the village apply to Dane County. Um, so, I mean, a clarification we can include with these is, you know, the program fund this program with TIF extension or other available sources, just to be clear that it's likely coming from TIF extension funds, but may come from another source. Yeah, and I mean, the other sources too, I, I agree with Nicole to keep some room in there, Al, because um, we're going to be having interest earnings on our dollars within the fund. We also may have uh, grant repayments that once repaid those funds uh, as repaid, uh, will be able to be reused uh, within the fund. So um, have, having a little wiggle in there would be useful. And then I already mentioned the, the, uh, the act from the federal government that might, might help us with some seed dollars or some other program in the future. Okay. okay. I posted to the chat and a, some suggested language for describing the affordable housing fund and for edits to the TIF extension piece in case we feel like we can review on the fly. Look at you getting all fancy with your technology, Jason. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say nerdy, but you can stick with fancy. <laughs> but we could circle back to that if we have time. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep moving then. Go ahead, Nicole. All right. Um, and then uh, next is uh, what Al just touched on, the community land trust development. Uh, review opportunities for that consisting of rehabbed or new construction homes uh, within a larger neighborhood or subdivision that would allow for long-term affordable home ownership with a ground lease. And again, I would add at the end of this that uh, funding for this type of development would be provided uh, through TIP extension funds or other available sources. Sounds good. Okay. Um, next, we have encouraged developers to explore the option of condominium ownership for various forms of attached unit housing within larger subdivision plots. So this kind of ties back to that, you know, complete neighborhood idea um, from the earlier recommendation and making sure that we have um, planned for areas that, that are designed for attached unit housing and not just uh, multifamily rental, but also condominium opportunities. Okay. And then the last one here um, is review lot size and design standards to encourage and allow for smaller, more affordable homes due to lower site and development costs. And again, this um, ties well to the <coughs> division that you guys have seen in terms of just thinking about 
planning and designing a little differently than the traditional subdivision to allow more flexibility. So when we talk about lot sizes, we talk in design standards to encourage and allow for smaller. We did that once and that's not what happened. So I'm just asking if there, how we can word that differently. Because Savannah Village, for example, has you know 7,000 square foot lots and the maximum house you could possibly build on them with very little grass or the very minimums that they could. And they built up and put their garages in different ways and they still have large homes. So it's not a smaller home that was really developed because of smaller land. So that one's one that I had a challenge with when, when I was reading through it. And me too, because the lot minimums or the square footage minimums are honestly pretty small. Um, I think typically 1,200 to 1,400 square feet and, and across subdivisions, no matter which one you pick, nobody ever builds as small as required. In my subdivision, I live in Savannah, we can build it with only a one-car garage. Um, and so, so, I mean, I appreciate this, this sentiment, but at the same time, we can't require people to build smaller what if we flip this on its head a little bit and suggest the creation of a district with a maximum lot size and a maximum home size? Is a developer going to go for that? I mean, they're going to want to sell their lots. And <laughs> if they have a client come in and they're 100 square foot over and they say, well, I'm going to have to go to a different subdivision, they're probably not going to really, I can see where the developers would have a hard time with this, with that concept. Not many of them, perhaps, but um, I mean, it, it could also be pitched. I mean, so you could have a district and say, we'd like to see this, you know, the intent of this district is that it be intermixed among other uh, uh, conventional districts within a larger plat, or perhaps it's, um, you know, an encouragement that this type of lot is created within PUDs. Uh, so a limited number of them, but someone who is, who is responding to the village's interest in in wanting affordable housing and, and seeking to curry favor with the village to to get to gain approval for their project could say, yeah, we're going to include some of these. Is, is another approach to if, uh, negotiate some level of deed restriction? Is that or is that is that a tricky way to go? Um. My question would be like, they've done that in a couple of subdivisions. There are a couple of subdivided lots in um, Middleton and in Madison where they have done you know, really basically tiny lot development and small footprint homes. And those homes are still retailing for $400,000 and $410,000 um, just because of demand. So I, I appreciate the sentiment behind it. I don't know if it's going to translate to affordability. Mm -hmm. Seems to me that, uh, you know, a, a developer coming in obviously is going to look at it first and foremost, what's my bottom line? You know, I'm going to have $60,000 in streets and sewer and water development costs in every lot. And obviously going smaller um, provides him potentially, you know, more revenue to offset that. But the reality being, He's also got to be able to turn around and sell it. Um, and then I, I don't know how you can dictate how people are going to buy. That's the, the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's probably a, a break even point in there somewhere, right? Between how much you're, you're selling them for and how many you can fit in. And that, that break even point is also probably moving over time as costs change so i think you're more likely to have success with your land trust um, proposal than this one where you're trying to tell the developer you know how big to make the lots in an attempt to hold down the houses because we it's like kristen said it's already proven not overly successful mm -hmm. i think we've been talking most of the time about um subdivisions within a division, uh, a larger project having this requirement. But um, I think there's consideration we ought to be careful about in that we don't create a neighborhood of, of all uh, affordable housing um, in one spot and, and therefore creating um, 
Um, I, I, I think we want to talk about do we are we concerned about keeping diversity of house prices within a development rather than moving an entire group of houses in a development to a, a lower price point. Okay. So Jason, you're more, and, and Nicole, you guys are more of the experts here, but I mean, we see right now with what's happening within the pandemic, where you would think that the, the housing prices would go down, we've actually seen this huge increase in demand for housing and there's not enough of it. And that's caused mm -hmm. all the prices of everything across the board to increase. Even yeah. more reducing how many affordable homes are really available. <laughs> so the people in your upper middle class higher, I would say, um, they're finding their homes. They're getting to a home and they're usually bidding against 10, 12, 15, 20, 30 other people to get a home. That's what's happening in the market right now. Now that probably is gonna subside. I'm assuming that's what's gonna happen, but that's one of the criteria. I just, with that type of phenomenon going with Wanaki being a popular destination to start with, how are, how are we gonna be able to build new homes that are gonna be in what we would consider the affordable range? And by the way, we could also still debate what the affordable range is. Um, I think that's always gonna be a debate, but. I don't know, do you guys, what are your guys' thoughts on that? I, mean, I guess I would ask, um, you know, I, we, we've talked about the Viridian development and the, those smaller lot sizes, which again, don't have any specific affordability restrictions, just have the idea that, hey, they should be more affordable because we're building them smaller. Is that something that um, the village encourage or is that is that how Viridian approached the village I guess you know it might be something that just depends on the developers so some developers are good at at, a, at developing more of a, a range of housing sizes and some developers you know specialize in a different type of single family housing development more traditional um, so it might not be something that we want to require across the board but rather take on that case-by-case -case basis. So that, that's where I'm going with it. And I'm glad you brought up Viridian because that's that was one of the things that was sold to our community was, you know, we're gonna have houses for under 300,000. Well, okay, that may be for the first buyer, but that buyer may quickly turn around and sell that because they can get 359, 389, whatever that price point is gonna be right now. And now we've lost mm -hmm. that potential for affordable housing again. Yeah. And that, that's something that's gonna be there. So I'm just trying to figure out Within, within what we're talking about with this topic, a small lot size, I don't, I don't see how that's gonna have anything to do with what's happening in the marketplace. The marketplace is gonna dictate this. It just does. Yeah, it's supply and demand. Uh, it, you know, nationwide, I think we have just within the past year caught up to the level of home building that was occurring uh, when, the, when the Great Recession hit. Um, but there's this huge, we've been in a trough ever since then and there's a huge backlog of units not built and so uh, every all these communities especially in dane county frankly just need to keep building we we kind of have to build our way out of the uh the, the price competition which then brings us back to does the community want to grow really fast to what you're talking about jason which probably is not the case um because that has different ripple effects so you're talking about a point in time though, Chris. And if you look to the future, I can guarantee you rates are going up. When yeah, rates yeah. go up, that's going to shut everything down. Uh, mortgages are going to go to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent. Maybe not to the Carter days for those of us who are old enough to know who Carter was, President Carter, but uh, when rates were at 18 percent, truly shut everything down. Uh, but it is going to slow down with the with the rates going up, and that will bring down lumber prices and commodity prices, and that will change the dynamics of what we're talking about. Now, what that means for affordable housing, usually, if if uh, rates are down, the cost is uh, the cost of input is up, and vice versa. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? It's hard to predict, and that's why, yeah, we can sit here, and you're right that someone's going to buy a home for three hundred ten thousand today. They're going to sell it for four hundred thousand tomorrow. And they're going to make the profit. It's no longer affordable. It was taken out of that uh, criteria. 
That's why, as I see and I sit back and listen to the discussion, uh, the land trust and having control over some of this is about all we can do with whatever the laws allow us to do. And, um, you know, I'm the type of guy that says I do things until I'm told not to. And, and you know, I'm, and I hear, we're going to hear uh, Todd talk about the loan program and some of the uh, stuff that's in there. My attitude, let's just do what we want to do. And as long as it meets the right criteria, you know, run it past the attorney and he slaps you on the fingers, we move things around, but let's just get something done. So I just don't know how we can control all those external economic macro factors in our, in our discussion in, within the paper we're putting together here. So maybe I took it to a different level there, but I was really focused on number 14, the lot size thing. I, I don't know why we need that in there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just don't see it as something that's going to help the situation unless we put a requirement on that. Like we said, um, that uh, it's a certain size home or less um, in limiting that size. And even well, if we do that, I still don't see that as something that's going to, they're still going to come back up to the market pricing. So it's really a principle or, or um, a guideline that in, of encouragement that uh, if a developer comes through, but it's not the developer. The developer simply puts the lots together, parses it in pieces and says, here you go, buyer. And it's the home builder that then puts this huge monstrosity on them and the homeowner that says, hey, put it on. So you got a lot of components coming together and you know, we might have a guideline or, or a principle. This is what we prefer to see, but I don't think we can get beyond that. So Unless if you're talking about uh, affordable housing, you probably have more success trying to do some kind of uh, sub loan program where, uh, you know, people who have income qualifications can get, you know, and again, got to find the money, but, you know, let's say, um, you know, you can, if you had a certain income level, you could apply for and get a $50,000 um, loan from a CDA that stays with the house so that, you know, if I come into it, that there's a component there that isn't controlled by that home buyer that, you know, blows up the affordability of it immediately as soon as it's done. I, it just popped into me. So I haven't put a lot of thought into that, but that probably has more, would have more impact than trying to restrict lot sizes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good discussion. Thank you. Um, so I, I think it makes sense to remove remove that one <laughs> um, from the red line. Um, and then I made I made notes to this. I'll send. I'll. Um, we want to go over the what Jason put in the chat, or I can add that into my red line as well. And then I'll get that to. Um, any other final comments, changes on this? You are <laughs> muted. If you have them, speak now or forever hold your peace um, with it. So it's hard because we don't see all the corrections that were made and everything. I mean, we all agreed to them as going, so we kind of have to go on you're going to make those corrections and wordings if we're going to vote. Yeah, I mean, I can. I'm on I'm on two laptops right now because I'm changing it in one of them. So I can um, if we want to move on to the next agenda item, um, I can make the red line and I can share my screen then and run it run through we'll it. We'll come right. back to it. OK, perfect. We have well, we have 23 minutes, so I hope we can get done. We might have to go over by a minute or two. Hopefully not. OK, so let's go on to the next agenda item. Oh, and I just closed my screen here. So we'll pop it up. There we go. All right, discuss and take action on policy development recommendations related to the use of affordable housing extension to funds. Todd, are you gonna yeah. go on this one? Yeah, and this is this is a this is a starting point for us. Today we're not gonna we're not gonna finalize this here today. Uh, I'm I'm interested in uh, planting some seeds that maybe can grow in your minds and we'll be back and talk more at a future meeting. Um, but uh, the board had uh, charged me as we were going down the road with Cone Esri to um, try to have a policy ready to go out of the gate with the dollars that became available with the extension of 
the, the TID dollar extent uh, from the affordable housing extension from the TID. And this was all, it was kind of a, kind of a set of dominoes that were gonna tip over to the eventual approval of whatever deal we were gonna start with, with Cohen Esri. Um, rather the board, uh, instead of those dominoes falling, the board chose to kind of handle Cohen Esri now as a one-off um, and just do the right deal that they can do with Cohen Esri. And that's gonna be occurring at their meetings here in April. Um, and then send back to the CDA discussion about what might be a, a lo longer term established program for use of these funds. Uh, consider the program, consider what it should be for and the parameters that we wanna uh, follow. So uh, to do this, I essentially duplicated, uh, well, I just attached the memo. Um, I have that in front of me up on my, my screen. You might wanna pull yours up too. Um, the memo that I gave to the board back uh, mid-February. And what I proposed in this, uh, the program that I was suggesting to be used to work with Cohen Esri was, was what I called the, uh, again, no, no ownership rights here, <laughs> but just the Wanakee uh, Housing Betterment Fund. Uh, and what I proposed was a, a grant program that would supply funding upfront to Cohen Esri uh, to a limited amount to be determined by the village board. But it was designed with a few uh, key uh, provisions. I'm going down to, to that now. That's on page, is that 12 of your packet? I think it's 12. So it's a 50% forgivable loan award under the Betterman program. Um, it established some limitations, as you can see in there, that related to the, the HUD and uh, medium income limits that are required for the program that Cohen Esri was participating in. And I give a lot of thanks to Nicole and Jason for helping craft some of these provisions. Um, essentially 10% 10 10 of the total project cost was the maximum limit uh, for a grant, uh, forgivable loan, whatever you want to call it. Um, no single project could use up 80% of the existing balance of the total fund, the total Wanaki Housing Betterment Program fund. Now, why did I pick that number? I was in that I was certainly looking and considering the numbers that Cohen Esri had been requesting of the village. That was in my mind. So I, I had in mind what I, what I kind of was envisioning was the need to be able to ac accomplish their request. So that's why that number was used. Doesn't mean that the village board has to go to that, of course, but, but that would, you know, I was trying to frame this. Um, the performance criteria uh, are there uh, that would have to be met to then uh, uh, make the award permanently forgiven after a period of time. Now I can share with you that there, there are some unique things about that I've learned about how companies finance projects like this that actually make the, the uh, refunding component something that actually they find favorable as an applicant. I don't totally get that. Nicole uh, gave me some insight into how that works, but I can, I can assure you that Cohen Esri uh, favored, in fact, they suggested that an approach, perhaps an approach that might be more politically, politically suitable uh, here would be one that would allow for them to provide a, a, uh, a repayment. Um, and then uh, there is language in there about demonstrating financial need. This isn't the same thing as pure TIF financing. There's no, there's no accompanying requirement by having used the, the TIF dollars from the uh, housing extension that require a project to meet the same but for standards as a project would have had to meet under a typical TIF, TIF award. Um, so that's not, that's not there and required, but we did feel that um, it, might, it might be reasonable to require an applicant to demonstrate 
suitable financial need. And we talk, I talk, there's language in there about how we might go about doing that. So those are some, you know, those are the, uh, you know, I kind of took a week of my work life <laughs> to design this for the village board. And that's really the best I could come up with, with limited, limited uh, examples out there in the marketplace and the marketplace being other communities that have utilized the TIF extension to support a fund. Um, I included in the, my research some information. Let me see if I can get to it up here. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my screen, You're not yours. Uh, but in pages 11 through 12, I laid out uh, some samples from Menasha, Madison, Middleton, Oshkosh, and so on, and some things that they have done. And there is this uh, sort of common program of supporting rehab and renovation programs at different levels. And that's something that I kind of want to hear from you tonight, if, that's, if that sounds attractive to you. I'm kind of thinking it is, because we already had it in our list of recommendations earlier. And sort of with direction from, from all of you, uh, I will go down the road of diving more deeply into these programs, seeing how to best craft them for our purpose, um, and understanding your questions so I can be prepared to answer them at a future meeting. And maybe there's things I didn't even talk, touch on here with the memo you saw. Maybe there's other programs that you're aware of um, that I didn't discover that you like me to research. And I, as staff and my team, are willing to do that research for the CDA. So today you're giving me some feedback and you're sending me on a mission to then come back with more for you to chew on at a future meeting. That was right. a lot of talking. I'm, I'm assuming everybody's ready for that. Look at that. I have to turn a light on because I'm in the dark. I didn't even realize that um, the screen is so bright. Um, but uh, I, my, my thing with this, one thing um, is income requirements. We have to look at people's income. Where I mean, if they're sitting in a, as Al pointed out, I think earlier, if they're at a million dollar home and their income is at a certain point and we want to, they want to replace their windows, I don't think that's what this is designed for. So we'd have to have some sort of income requirements that we put into this. I think that the amount of the awards, we should probably um, cap that. You know, Todd said up to 80% of the fund. I, I'm a little concerned with putting 80% um, because we have some future TIFs that are going to be closing their, you know, several million dollars that we're going to all of a sudden have potentially at our disposal. Um, you know, that could be a significant project um, that would take up a lot of those funds. But maybe that's what we'd want to use it for. 80% seems high to me, but. That's yeah, I, you know, I'd add, Chris, that I was kind of, Again, remember, Cohen Esri was in mind. Sure, I get it. As that was designed, and I, I, you know, I was sort of, sort of, keeping in mind that every policy once created is also changeable, for our changing circumstances. And as we see the progression of our TIF districts closing and the opportunity to bring in, you know, maybe a, a million dollar influx in, in one kick, you know, before we do that, maybe there's reason to look carefully at our policy. Sure. And, and, and the other thing that came into my mouth is house flippers. You know, they're going to come in and they see something that's down and all of a sudden they're going to be coming to our door to get the money to do their flip. That might be a thing we'd have yeah. to be taking. What I, showed you here, well. what I showed you here in this memo are real little snippet summary, bullet summaries of what our uh, more expansive program criteria in all these different communities. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're definitely not uh, simple. Um, you know, that there is, again, I'll use the word rigor involved in completing the application and then for the community to, to manage, manage the process. So I'm, I'm looking for all of your guidance with this one. That's why we kicked it down to the CDA to come up with this policy. I think this is, this is something that's very important with us. We've established, we're going to use our healthy TIFs or TIDs and, um, close them early for this process and purpose of affordable housing. I think that it's important that we know how we're gonna spend that money. And Al, you've already pointed that out with our initial language that we were looking at was how is that money gonna be spent? So um, ideas from all of you are gonna be important. Todd's gonna to take those ideas, um, look at other places. And as he mentioned, there's not a lot of communities that have a lot out there about this because there haven't been that many of these used, um, frankly. Actually, I was I'm just reading that, that's, there's just not a lot out there. But I would say this, we're, we're in the mix of, of uh, something that's coming, coming to popularity now. Um, I was just reading an article today and I emailed the, um, 
Oh, Shorewood, Shorewood in Milwaukee County. They just approved their first extension, two point something million in one year. And it's brand, a brand new fund for them. I emailed the administrator there to see if they have criteria that they've built uh, around the use of that. Um, so we may learn some things here soon. But, but we're, we're in good company in that other communities are starting to make use of this tool. Comments or suggestions? Or do you guys all still want to chew for another month um, on this to bring it back to Todd? I'm just trying to give him some direction as far as what you guys may be interested in. Al, you look like you're ready to talk, so just go ahead. I'll start. <laughs> I've already hit the mute unmute button about 10 times, trying not to interrupt. My, my, my bigger comment is, again, it fits within the plan of what are we gonna do with this money? And this is one program of what we would like to perhaps do with the money. I think from my perspective, it's too restrictive. I don't think it's enough. I don't think it goes far enough. And I think I have a lot of things I could add to it as to what qualifies versus what doesn't qualify. As far as the $440,000, as I said previous, as I said in a prior meeting, I'm not in favor of giving too much of that away to an existing project for many reasons. I'd like to keep more of that money into this fund to create programs for um, whether it's a, a down payment for a house, whether it's for improvement to a house, but there are other programs that we addressed previously uh, and went through an extensive list of options that other places are doing that I think we need to go back and now incorporate perhaps into this program. I think we're gonna have enough, in my recommendation, be keep enough money back of that 440, uh, which allows us and gives us latitude to do a whole lot of things, which one would, would which one of my recommendations would have been use 25% to hire someone to help us with this program because there will be some compliance needs to it. And we need someone on staff to help us with that process. If we're gonna go down this route of keeping track. Now, I'm not in favor of of uh, the small dollar amounts because it's not worth it. Um, and we have to be careful when you say forgivable loan, does that create taxable income? Anytime a loan is forgiven, it's taxable income to the recipient. So I think we wanna be careful with the language we use. Is it a grant or is it a loan and what the difference is from a tax standpoint? Because the last thing people wanna recognize, hey, I've forgiven $10,000 of a loan, I have now have taxable in income that to pay taxes on. That's a detail. And my point is that I think, uh, you know, from my perspective, I'd like to see a plan. I'd like to see this well-funded and I'd like to see a number of programs come out of this. Uh, some of which we've already talked about in prior, in prior CDA meetings. And I think there are others. And as I said earlier, you know, this is relatively new. Why don't we be the trendsetter? We don't need to sit back in the back seat looking at what other people do. We can create our own program unless the, law, the legal department says, no, we can do it. I, I would tell you that the forgivable loan proposal was constructed from nothing. So that, that isn't a sample. Um, I would also, and maybe Nicole can help out with this, that um, again, remember, that's framed with Cone Esri in mind and there are nonprofit elements to that that make the forgivable loan approach uh, something of particular interest to, to their situation. And I appreciate that. I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not all knowing and I'm talking off the cuff here, uh, but just the concepts I'm trying to get across is the plan, uh, the program and funding, uh, having available funding for those programs. Because I think we can go a long way if we want to. We could be the we could be the stars of Dane County if we want to be. You're on mute, Chris. Stars that, was of Dane one, that was step one in the process, Al, for you to admit <laughs> to being not all knowing. So I was proud of you for just saying that. That's awesome. That's that's step one, which is great. So thank you for those comments, Todd. I'm sure you're writing all this down. I, that's, uh, that's that's great. Chris, did you have any comments? I thought we were already the stars of Dane County, so I'm surprised to hear that we're not. 
uh, number one. Uh, number two, I'm focused on page 11. I believe that we need to view this as something that'll be evolved and perfected over time as our own experience plays out as well as the experience of others. I was really impressed with the volume of information and the scope of, of programs that were reviewed. Um, lots of questions, but lots of answers already thought out in the document. Thanks, Todd. And Nicole and Jason. And Al. And Al. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> sorry, Jeff Tews, go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering if there are um, opportunities uh, around partnerships when you talk about doing something uh, unique, thinking about partnerships. And you know, the only one that comes first to mind, I'm sure there are many others, is Habitat for Humanity. Are there, are there ways for us to, um, you know, thinking about how you know we've got this four hundred forty thousand dollars? Is there, is there some way to partner with somebody who's already good at developing affordable housing and finding clients who are really are in that kind of need and getting them to participate. I've, only, I've been involved with three Habitat home builds and you know really understand what those families commit to do and how committed they are to the, to the project and how much they have to contribute in terms of work and, and funding of it. Um, and as well as how efficient Habitat is with their money. I'm not here to promote Habitat. My question is, are there partnerships like that uh, that we ought to include, at least in our thoughts? Yeah, another that comes to mind, um, in addition to Habitat, is Project Home. So I think organizations like that would have a good sense um, of, of what really works for, for um, homeowners and also could um, perhaps help implement a, a program, you know, if they have rehab capabilities and could also serve maybe as a, as a leverage source. So maybe have, they, if they have program dollars and could leverage it with village um, program dollars, that might be another opportunity. Yeah. And they can work as that filter to qualify the actual homeowners. I know Habitat does a lot of that and they create mentors for those families. They have financial advice, have a whole bunch of stuff that goes along with it besides just the home. Mm -hmm. uh, Operation Fresh Start is another organization that comes to mind that dabbles in different elements of both home building and remodeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Kristen, you have a lot of uh, experience with those folks as well. I know they came into a Jeff with our housing task force and talked about those different programs. So, and I'll tell you that I have three marks on my knuckles from my time with Habitat for Humanity that'll never go away. Um, anyway, that's beside the point. Um, the roof still did not leak, so that's a good sign. Um, regardless. I, I would just comment that, that our real small church, Crossroads United Methodist Church, participated in funding one of those uh, together with uh, 11 other churches. We created an apostles build. And um, we went together. So there's ways to leverage other community resources um, that we ought to perhaps be the conduit for also. So I, I just, uh, just think there's opportunities for us to take and, and not just find money and, and spend it, but uh, leverage it in ways through other organizations. So I think what I'm hearing you say, Jeff, is maybe we could do almost like a match program where we're putting X dollars from this fund towards a Habitat for Humanity project. Is that kind of what you're, yeah, okay. Okay, Dave Kennedy, Jason, you're not ready yet. I think, you know, uh, one concern I have is uh, we seem to be trying to cover all avenues here and, you know, or everywhere from the the multifamily to single family to rehab and with a limited budget that we have, maybe we should focus on an area where we could have the most impact um, with the limited amount of dollars that we have. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the ultimate result is with the uh, apartment complex, but you know, certainly we could do a lot more impact on more people if we concentrate our funds towards, you know, starting out in the rehab process and, uh, you know, grow from there as that fund can grow. Okay. All right, I think that's everybody. Um, Jason, you have 30 seconds. 
as this continues to develop, okay. one one possibility might be that. Uh, so what's what's here right now, as Todd acknowledges, is sort of specific to uh, the Cohen Esri project, or was written with that in mind, um, and uh, or, or maybe more generally, more generally, it's more specific to uh, a project like that. And we've also talked about other types of funding that support owner-occupied rehab uh, that support new owner-occupied. Uh, perhaps there are some overarching uh, uh, guidelines for the fund uh, that say, for example, you know, another thing that's not explicit in here that could be, because I just heard it, is that uh, you know, we primarily support projects that have other sources of funding as well. So it's, the fund is used to leverage outside sources of funding. Um, and also that perhaps we, that you consider um, a, a rough balance of what a percentage of this fund that's used for owner occupied housing and a percentage that's used for renter occupied housing. Uh, to, to David's point, you're gonna get, you're gonna affect more families probably in the renter occupied market. And that's probably where the lion's share goes. Uh, but to be explicit about saying, now eh, we're reserving a portion for the owner occupied market. I think that deserves some discussion. Thanks, Jason. Todd, does that give you, from what everybody said, some stuff? Yeah, I can't wait Al, to Al's hire. Al's got his finger up. Go ahead, one okay. second. Go ahead, Al. Yeah, and I don't know where to go with it. I have some thoughts, but what about workforce, workforce housing and engaging the people from the business park in defining what that means for them, as opposed to us trying to tell what it means for them? In other words, if, if we can come up with some type of program, and like I said, I have some thoughts in mind, which we don't need to get into the details now, but maybe that should be incorporated within this uh, process is identifying those from the business park. And maybe it's not just the business park. I don't mean to be so isolating to just that group of people, but identifying workforce housing for uh, various employers in, in the village of Wanakee. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great idea, Al, engaging all the business community to, to get their input. I think we've tried to do some of that, but um, you know, we've had get togethers with different businesses and there's four or five that participate. We don't get a huge swath of them um, you know, coming to, to hear or talk about this, but if yeah, we I'd, I'd be much there. more aggressive. I'd be much more aggressive, Chris, in coming up with a program that says, "Hey, we're we're thinking about creating workforce housing, and here's what we're looking at, and here's what type of financial commitment we'd like from you, if possible, or would you be willing to invest?" And what that means, that I don't know yet. Whether okay. it's a partnership, right. whether it's a rate of return, what it is, but supplying various businesses with with employees is the bottom line. Yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, Jeff, you're one of those people I know in, in, in the community that has a business and is looking for people constantly to work for, for him. So, um, you know, that, that's just one employer, but, you know, we talk, everybody knows high V is coming. Uh, we all know it's coming. And when they bring the need for 250 employees in, you know, where are those employees going to come from? You know, th that might be a good question for, for them, Todd, if we reached out to them to say, you know, would you be willing to partner with it? To Al's point, you know, what are they looking for? Um, and what would they be willing to maybe participate in from a financial side? So with, with, the, with the money from the extension fund, TIF extension fund, and, and uh, you know, Village may donate X dollars to help to get this thing off the ground. And then the employers contribute Y dollars. And then from there, you create some type of uh, workforce housing for the group. Sure, okay. All right, Todd, I think you've got enough to work with there. Yes, at least for right now. Yeah, I can't wait to assign it to a newly hired community development director. <laughs> or let me say, let me back up. Wait I look forward minute. to working with, <laughs> look forward to working with the community development director. Um, you, can, can I just quickly note that um, I think the Kristen and Chris are here representing the village board in our hearing clearly what the what the board is saying understand that again the board took out from under the cda and whatever is created here whatever it is they end up doing for cohen esri that stands that stands aside from this um, and i don't know what that will mean in terms of dollars left 
So I just, I want to be kind of blunt. Well, that was blunt. That was right, right, right on Todd with, <laughs> with what we chose to do. And we'll see that. We do have several others on the near horizon though, that will be closing. So we, we can be prepared for them when that happens this way too. So. Yeah, we did, we did show the board that there was a schedule of these four or five TIF districts. And over the course of the next five or six years, there's going to be several closures that could put the fund well past a million in new dollars. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on from that and go back to Nicole. Now she should have our document ready that we were going to make for recommendation. Correct? Correct. There it is. Can you see? Okay. Yeah. So we added in a recommendation specifically stating that a Wanakee affordable housing fund would be established to support Nicole, housing. Quick, quick favor. Could you hit the zoom button bottom right and go in a little ah, tighter? A little bigger. Thank see, you. It's, in my, it's on my giant screen, so I can see it just fine. Okay. <laughs> is that better? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, establish a Wanakee affordable housing fund to support housing projects in the village, capitalize primarily with TIF district affordable housing extensions as allowed by state statute, further develop a set of programs that are supported by the fund. Does that, that, that sound good? And then um, under the, the TIF specific one, we broke that down into two. So a pursue affordable housing TID extensions as allowed, direct funds to the Wanaki Affordable Housing Fund. And then we kept in the, the project specific TIF. And then lastly, um, in terms of zoning of districts that allow for two to eight attached units and promote this type of development with developers. Um, the rehab loan program for order, older affordable housing stock, funding for this program may come from TIF extensions or other available funding. Would that one be? Oh, that from, would be uh, the from the Wanaki Affordable Housing Fund. Yes. Funding for this program. Would come from the Wanaki. Okay. Or other available funding, it still applies. Okay. And same for this one. I would just add that same for the Community Land Trust. And then we removed the final recommendation related to lot sizes. Does that look, look good? Any other adjustments? Well, we're going to see if it looks good because we're going to need a motion. There you go. <laughs> on that. So do we have a motion to approve this for recommendation to the village board? Just before the, before the motion, um, Kristen, is there, did you cap, capture uh, Kristen's point about uh, making certain that we're, uh, do we need to put in here at this point what our um, span of, of authority is uh, and, and to her point about having elected officials really be uh, um, accountable. I, I, don't, I don't know if that happens in this document or that's another, another discussion or recommendation to the village board. I think that's just kind of the practices of the, the village. I'd agree with that, Kristen, that that's the practice of the village right now. And I don't know if this is the right document for it. it I think okay. when we do the, how we're gonna fund portions, how we're, how we're gonna, who's gonna actually make the decisions on the funding, that's probably where that's gonna be appropriate. I don't know if this is the right document. Okay, okay, I'm all right with that. Okay, so then I'd look for a motion to approve this. Move to approve. All right, Chris Arungi. Do you want me to read all the points? Um, I think just as presented by Nicole would be fine. Everybody as presented by Nicole. Okay. Do we have a second? 
Okay, Dave Kennedy is the second. Any other comments? Al, this is your chance. Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Todd. Roll call vote, please. David Kennedy? Yes. Kristen Rungi? Yes. Jeff Tews? Al Dassau? I saw a thumbs up from Jeff. Al Dassau? Yes. And Chris Elner? Yes. Okay, motion passes to 5 to 0. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll blame Ann for being eight minutes over, nine minutes over now because she wasn't here. And I'm, I'm sure she would have shortened the conversation uh, <laughs> as well as um, Jeff. So we'll blame them. But we need one more motion. Motion to move or adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you moving to, Al? <laughs> motion to adjourn by Al. Second by Kristen Rungi. Here we go. Uh, Todd, roll call vote, please. Chris Zellner? Yes. Al Dassau? Yes. Jeff Tews? Yes. Kristen Rungi? Yes. And David Kennedy? Yes. I would add this, this ends Nicole's work with us, by the way. Um, you've, Nicole, it's been a pleasure working with you. You've done a really nice job. So I'll give you one of these. Oh, and thank you. We wish you a lot of, um, a lot of success in your new gig. Thank you very much. I, I've really enjoyed working with you all. Thanks for the great discussion. And I'm so interested in what's going on. I'm gonna keep paying attention to, to the village. Yes. Keep my eye on you. Can you share with us what you're doing, what you're currently doing? Yes, I'm, I'm working um, uh, at a place called Sonair Solutions. It's a, a large affordable housing equity and, and lending firm, but I'm working on the development side. Oh, very good. Yeah. Awesome. Well, very. we all wish you luck for that, Nicole, and I'm sure it's going to go great for you. So we appreciate all your assistance, and we will try not to screw anything up with your department. <laughs> okay, sounds right. good. Thanks, all. Thank you, everybody. Have a good great night. night. Good night. Have a good night. Now.